Chapter Four, Part F of Greener Than You Think. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Greener Than You Think by Ward Moore. Chapter Four, Part F. But the catastrophic loss of their great armies was not all the enemy had to endure. As the grass had stood our ally and swallowed the attackers, helping us in a negative fashion, as it were, it now turned and became a positive force in our relief. Unnoticed for months, it had crept northwestward, filching precious mile after mile of the hostile foothold. Now it spurted ahead, as it had sometimes done before, at a furious pace, to take over the coast as far north as the Russian River, which now doubled the irony of its name, and added thousands of square miles to its area at the enemy's expense. It surged directly westward, too, making what was left of the invader's foothold precarious in the extreme. The stock market boomed, and the country went wild with joy at the news of the Soviet defeats. At the darkest moment we have been delivered by forces outside ourselves, but still indubitably American. Hymns of praise were sung to the grass as the savior of the nation, and in a burst of gratitude it was declared a national park, forever inviolate. Rationing restrictions were eased, and many industries were sensibly returned to private ownership. Good old Uncle Sam was unbeatable after all. But if the Americans were jubilant, the Russians were cast into deepest gloom. Accustomed to tremendous wartime losses of manpower, they had at first taken the news stoically, interpreting it as just another defeat to be later redeemed by pouring fresh troops, and then more fresh troops after those which had gone down. But when they realized they had lost not divisions but whole armies, that they had suffered a greater blow than any in their history, that their reserve power was little greater than the armies remaining to the Americans, and finally that the grass, the foe which had dealt all these grievous blows, was rapidly wiping out what remained of their bridgehead, they began to murmur against the war itself. Under our dear little Uncle Stalin, they said, this would never have taken place. Our sons and brothers would not have been sent to die so far away from Holy Mother Russia. Down with the enemies of Stalin! Down with the war-mongering bureaucracy! The Kremlin hastened to assure the population it was carrying out the wishes of the sainted Stalin. It convinced them of the purity of its motives by machine-gunning all demonstrators and executing after public trials all Trotskyite fascist American saboteurs and traitors. For some reason these arguments failed to win over the people, and on November 7th a new slogan was heard, long live stalin and trotsky which proved so popular that in a short time the entire bureaucracy was liquidated the soviet union declared an unequivocal worker state the army replaced by red guards the selling of soviet bonds decreed a contravention of socialist economy wages of all were equalized and the word stakhanovism erased from all russian dictionaries no formal peace was ever made neither side had any further appetite for war and though newspapers like the daily intelligencer continued for months to clamor for the resumption of hostilities even to using aircraft now that there was less danger of reprisal both countries seemed content to return quietly to the status quo the only results of the war aside from the tremendous losses was that in america the grass had been unmolested for a year and the soviet union had a new constitution one of the peculiar provisions of this constitution was that political offenders and the definition was now severely limited leaving out ninety nine per cent of those formerly jeoparded should henceforth expiate their crimes by spending the term of their sentence gazing at the colossal and elaborate tomb of stalin which occupied the center of red square general stuart thario rudely treated by an ungrateful republic had the choice of a permanent colonelcy or retirement I have always thought it was his human vanity making him cling to the title of general which caused him to retire. At any rate, there was no difficulty in finding a place for him in our organization, and if his son's salary and position were reduced in consequence, it was all in the family, as the saying goes. 
One of the happy results of our unique system of free enterprise was the rewarding of men in exact proportion to their merits and abilities. The war, bringing disruption and bankruptcy to so many shiftless and short-sighted people, made of consolidated pemmican one of the country's great concerns. The organization welcoming General Thario was far different from the one which had hired his son. I now had fourteen factories, stretching like a string of lustrous pearls from Quebec down to Montevideo, and I was negotiating to open new branches in Europe and the Far East. I had been elected to the directorship of several important corporations, and my material possessions were enough to constitute a nuisance, for I have always remained a simple literary sort of fellow at heart, requiring secretaries and stewards to look after them. It is a depressing sidelight on human nature that the achievement of eminence brings with it the malice in spite of petty minds, and no one of prominence can avoid becoming the target of stupid and unscrupulous attack. It would be pointless now to go into those carping and unjust accusations directed at me by irresponsible newspaper columnists. Another man might have ignored these mean assaults, but I am naturally sensitive, and while it was beneath my dignity to reply personally, I thought it perhaps one of the best investments I could make to add a newspaper to my other properties. Now, I am certainly not the sort of capitalist portrayed by cartoonists in the early part of the century who would subvert the freedom of the press by hand-picking an editor and telling him what to say. I think the proof of this, as well as of my broad-mindedness, is to be found in the fact that the paper I chose to buy was the Daily Intelligencer, and the editor I retained was William Rufus Lafassacy. The Intelligencer had lost both circulation and money since it had, so to speak, no home base. But moved, perhaps by sentiment, I was not deterred from buying it for this reason, and anyway it was purchasable at a more reasonable figure on this account. Small circulation or no, it, or rather Lafassacy himself, still possessed that intangible thing called prestige, and I was satisfied with my bargain. Lafassacy showed no reluctance, as why indeed should he, to continue as managing editor, and acted toward me as though there had never been any previous association. But I did not object to this harmless eccentricity as a smaller-minded person might have. As publisher I named General Thario. I never knew exactly what purpose a publisher serves, but it seemed necessary for every newspaper to have one. Whatever the duties of the office, it left the general plenty of time to attend to the concerns of consolidated pemmican. I fed the paper judiciously with money, and it was not long before it regained most of the circulation it had lost. There was no doubt the grass, our ally to such good purpose in the war, had definitely slowed down. Now it was looked upon as a fixture, a part of the American heritage, a natural phenomenon which had outlived its sensational period and come to be taken for granted. Botanists pointed out that Cynodon Dactylon, despite its ability to sheathe itself against a chill, had never flourished in cold areas, and there was no reason to suppose the inoculated grass, even with its abnormal metabolism, could withstand climates foreign to its habit. It was true it had touched in one place the Arctic tundra, but it was confidently expected this excursion would soon cease. The high peaks of the Rockies, with the heavy winter snowdrifts lying between them, promised no permanent hospitality, and what seeds blew through the passes and lighted on the Great Plains were generally isolated by salt bands, and, since they were confined to comparatively small clumps, they were easily wiped out by salt or fire. To all appearance the grass was satiated, and content to remain crouching over what it had won. Only a minority argued that in its new form it might be infinitely adaptable. Before, when stopped, it had produced seeds capable of bearing the parent strain, so now, they argued, it would in time acclimate itself to more rigorous temperatures. Among these pessimists, Miss Frances, emerging from well-deserved obscurity, hysterically ranged herself. She prophesied new sudden and sweeping advances, and demanded money and effort equal to that expended in the late war be turned to combating the grass, as if taxes were not already outrageously high. Those in authority, with a little judicious advice from persons of standing, quite properly disregarded her querulous importunities. 
the whole matter of dealing with the weed was by now in the hands of a permanent body the federal disruptions commission this group had spent the first six months of its existence exactly defining and asserting its jurisdiction which seemed to spread just as the vegetation calling it into being did and the second six months wrangling with the federal trade commission over certain cease and desist orders issued to firms using allusions to the grass on the labels of their products thereby implying they were as vigorous or of as wide application as the representation the disruptions commission had no objection in principle to this castigation they merely thought it should have come from their regulatory hands but with the end of the war a new spirit animated the honorable members of the commission and as a token of revived energy they issued a stern directive that no two groups engaged in anti-graminous research were to pool their knowledge for competition the commission argued in the sixty-seven page order spurred enthusiasm and the rivalry between workers would the sooner produce a solution having settled this basically important issue they turned their attention to investigating the slower progress of the grass to determine whether it was permanent or temporary and whether its present sluggishness could be turned to good account as a sort of side project perhaps to show the wideness of their scope they undertook as well to study the reasons for the failure of the wartime inoculation of the steps as contrasted with the original too successful california one they planned a compilation of their findings tentatively scheduled to cover a hundred and forty seven folio volumes which would remain the basic work for all approaching the problem of attacking the grass and as an important public figure who had some first-hand knowledge of the subject they requested me to visit at my own expense the newest outposts of the weed and favor them with my observations i was not averse to the suggestion for the authority of the commission would admit me to areas closed to ordinary citizens and i was toying with the idea it might be possible in some way to use the devil grass as an ingredient in our food products george thario having shown in many ways he was growing stale on the job and in need of a vacation i decided to take him with me besides if the thought of using the weed as a source of cheap raw material came to anything the engagement of his interest at an early stage would increase his usefulness before setting out for the field i read reports of investigators on the spot and was disquieted to note a unanimous mention of new stirrings on the edges of the green glacier i decided to lose no time and we set out at once in my personal plane for a mountain lodge kindly offered by a business acquaintance here for the next few weeks keeping in touch with my manifold affairs only by telephone joe and i devoted ourselves to observing the grass or rather i did george thario's idea of gathering data differed radically from mine i feel safe to say as well as from that of almost any other intelligent man in a way he reminded me of the cameraman slave in his brooding obliviousness to everything except the grass but Slaife had been doing a job for which he was being paid, whereas Joe was only yielding to his own mood. For hours he lay flat on his belly, staring through binoculars. At other times he wandered about the edge, looking at, feeling, and smelling it, and once I saw him bend down and nibble at it like a sheep. "'You know, A.W.,' he observed enthusiastically. He always called me A.W., with just enough of a curious intonation to make it doubtful whether the use of the initials was respectful or satirical. "'You know, A.W., I understand those fellows who went and chucked themselves into the grass. It's sublime. It has never happened in nature before. I've read newspaper and magazine accounts, and either the writers have no eyes, or else they lie for the hell of it.' They talk about the dirty brown of the flowers, but A.W., I've seen the flowers myself, and they're a vivid, glorious purple. Have you noticed the iridescent sparkle when the wind ripples the blades? All the colors of the spectrum against the background of that marvelous green. There's nothing marvelous about it, I told him a little irritably. It used to be really green, a bright, even color, but up here where it's high and cold it doesn't look much different from ordinary devil grass. Dirty and ugly. I thought his enthusiasm distinctly out of place in the circumstances. He did not seem to hear me, but went on dreamily. And the sounds it makes. My God, A.W., 
A composer give half the years of his life to reproduce those sounds, high and piercing, soft and muted, creating tome poems and etudes there in its lonely grandeur. I have spoken before of the noise produced by the weed, a thunderous crackling and snapping attributable to its extraordinary rate of growth. During its dormancy the sound had ceased, and, in the mountains at least, was replaced by different notes and combination of notes, as the wind blew through its combs and scraped the tough stems against each other. Occasionally these ululations produced reflections extremely pleasing. More often it hurt the ears with a shrieking discordance but even at its best it fell far short to my mind, and I suppose I may say I'm as sensitive to beauty as anybody, of meriting Joe's extravagant rhapsodies. But he was entranced beyond the soberness of common sense. He filled notebooks, those thick pulp-paper volumes which children are supposed to use in school but never do, with his reactions. In idle moments, when he was away, I glanced through them, and for the most part they were incoherent meterless poems, lists of adjectives, strained interpretations of the actions of the grass, and many musical notations which seemed to get no farther than a repetitive and faltering start. I reproduce a few pages of the less chaotic material for what it is worth. The Ice Age drove the Cro-Magnum from the caves which prophesied Gnosis and Pythum and the Temple of Athena in the Acropolis. This grass, twentieth-century ice, drives magnets from their twenty-room villas to their twenty-room duplexes. The loss was yesterday's. Walt Whitman. For it is the animals, cows and pigs, horses, goats, sheep, and rabbits, abandoned by the husbandman, startled, puzzled, the clock with the broken mainspring running backward, the small game, deer, antlered, striped, and spotted, wild sheep, ovis poli, Teddy Roosevelt shot and Audubon printed, mountain goats leaping in terror to hazardous safety on Babel's top, upward to the pinpoint where no angels dance, but not alone. Meat and meat-eater, food and feeder, predator and prey, foxes, lynx, coyotes, wolves, wildcats, mountain lions, the passenger pigeons gone, the dung they peck from herds thick as man born, and man yet to be born lies no more on the plains. Night and day we traveled, but the birds overhead gave cover from the sun, and the buffalo before us stretched from the river to the hills, driven by the ice, not ice, but living green, up and up. Pause here upon this little shelf to nibble bark, to mate and bear, to snarl and claw and rend and suck hot blood from the moving jugular vein, and then move again upward with docile hoof, or else retreat with lashing tail and snarling fang. Spider and bitten, transfused with fear, the timber line behind, the snow alone welcoming. Ironically, the glacier meets another glacier, and only glacier gives refuge to glaciers haunted. Here little islands on the peaks. Vegetation sea as death creeping upward to end at the beginning. The carnivores, whipped-tailed, seek the top ambition's pinnacle, surveying nothing. Tomorrow is for man. The lower mind is reasonable and ponders food and dung and lust. So obstinate the pad-claw prowls higher till nothing's left but pedestal, and would then wing, but being not yet man can only turn again. The ruminants, resigned, nibble at the edges of their death, converting death to life, chewing, swallowing, digesting, regurgitating, and digesting again, inescapable fate, reluctant sustenance, Empty-bellied, the pointed teeth descend again to take their food at second hand, to go back sated, brown blood upon the snow and bits of hide and hair, gnawed at bones, while fellows, forgetting fear, remaining stoic, eat, stamp, and stamp without impatience, and eat again of that which has condemned them. Learned doctor, your adding machine gives you the answer. So many carnivores, so many herbivores. The parallel dashes introduce extinction. Confusedly, the savor of Abel's sacrifice was sweet to his nostrils, not Cain's fruits. So is the mind confounded. Turning and devouring each other over prostrate antlers, the snarlers die, their furry hides bloat and then collapse on rigid bones to make a place for curious sniffings and quick retreat in trampled snow. There is no victory without harshness, 
no hope in triumph. The placid ruminants live. The conquerors have conquered nothing. The grass comes to the edge of the snow. They eat and fill their meager bellies. They chew the cud and mate and calve and live in wretched unawareness of the heat of glory and death. So is justice done and mercy, and yet not justice, and yet not mercy. Who was victor yesterday is not victor today, but neither is he victim. Who was victim yesterday is not victor, but neither is he victim. End of chapter 4, part F.